All right. Please remind me if you guys see an error come up about my recording. <laughs> Learning in memory. All right, cool. And it did it again. Slack. I think I need to just like minimize the back one. There we go. Um, sweet. Okay, cool. So we are going to go over learning memory today. So this is going to be part one of two. Uh, today is going to be more kind of exploring how complicated memory is in general. There's tons and tons of different facets to memory. Uh, and next week, or next class on Wednesday is where we'll take more of a deep dive into the actual brain mechanisms and like what's going on behind the scenes for a lot of this. So the way that you should look at this is this one is kind of your flashcard material, stuff that you should really memorize. Uh, and then Wednesday is going to look at how all of those different topics all kind of mingle and work together. So, so today's lecture. So like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're going to be dealing with a lot of definitions today and kind of exploring what this space looks like. There's a lot of different facets to memory, a lot of different uh, angles that we can look at, and all of these different types of memory rely on different systems. And so this is a really, really complicated topic. I mean, covering this in two lectures is not doing justice at all. Um, that's kind of the case with all of these topics. Um, but we're going to start with kind of definitions of what all these memory processes are and how we've differentiated them from each other. We're going to do kind of a surface level dive into the anatomy and just look at who the players are that are involved. Uh, we're going to look at ways in which these mechanisms can, fall, uh, can fail. So we'll look at amnesia and uh, lesion type studies. Those give us a lot of really good information early on about how these were different processes, these different definitions that we're going to see. A certain lesion patients would lose one and still have the other. And then at the end, we'll kind of explore how people are starting to think about these different mechanisms. So memory itself is kind of incredible. I mean, I say that in every lecture, I mean, the brain itself is incredible. But uh, our ability to draw on these things really gives us our sense of agency, right? We're able to make up a story about who we are and where we've been and what we've been through. And it also has this evolutionary adaption, right? It, it allows us to learn from our mistakes and not repeat the same things over and over and over again. Um, and we as humans have a very, very flexible memory system that allows us to learn much quicker than other animals do. So there are different types of memory, uh, and this slide is kind of getting into the, the temporal process of these. There are different memory systems that kind of operate in different time sequences. So sever sensory memory, is the shortest of them. And so this is really heavily tied to attention mechanisms and things like that. Uh, so when we hear things, even if we're not paying attention to it, some of that information is kept online very temporarily from milliseconds to seconds. But we really have to employ our attention mechanisms to keep this stuff online. And when we decide to keep a sensory memory online, that's where we get into short-term and work working memory. And so this is something that relies really heavily on the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is implicated in like keeping things online. And so we can kind of work with stuff for seconds to minutes. So Short-term memory is just this idea that we have, we have something that just happened. We're keeping it up so we can figure out how important it is. Working memory refers to the fact that while we're keeping that thing online, we can actually manipulate it. So you can memorize like five different numbers, and while those numbers are in short-term memory, you can do mathematical operations on them. You can manipulate that information while it's being kept online. And then once we get past short-term memory, we get into long-term memory, which can last an entire lifetime. I mean, this is pretty amazing that we have these, these memories, these codes of information. And you've got to remember, like what I talked about the first day of class, the brain is just kind of encased in this dark skull. All it gets are these neural impulses, these electrical synapses and chemical transmissions. And somehow there's patterns of information within those neurons that can hold something online your entire life. Even if you're not consciously aware that it's still there, you can smell a cookie and all of a sudden you're like back at grandma's house from when you're like three years old. Stuff is really, really powerful. And we're, we're just now kind of cracking the surface of this. Uh, memory is a very, very heavily studied topic in cognitive neuroscience. 
just here at U of O, I think out of the like 15 researchers that we have in cognitive neuroscience, seven of them study memory. So really, really big part of Cognero. So when we're talking about long-term memory in general, uh, we're splitting these things. Actually, this, this applies to all of these systems, but uh, mostly to the things that we're kind of storing and have access to. Uh, it's going to be split into declarative and non-declarative. And the difference between these is just this idea that declarative, if you really break the word apart, it's something that we can declare. It's something that we can verbally uh, talk about. We can share with one another. And so these are facts that we can actually talk about, things that, that need to be communicated. Whereas non-declarative memory is referring to these things that we don't necessarily have some type of explanation for. It's just something that happens sort of automatically. That we, we notice if we reflect on it, it's things like uh, muscle memory, so procedural memory. But it's not something that we necessarily have words to describe. So this is kind of a non-conscious process. And the way that you can kind of think about this is like declarative memory is a very active process. It's engaging. It's voluntary. And non-declarative is something that is happening more uh, non-consciously, kind of under the surface. And this is going to be really important because these rely on completely different types of, of mechanisms. We talked about uh, action in our last uh, lecture. We talked about basal ganglia and how important it is for habitual type stuff, like in these questions we just went over at the beginning of class. That's referring to this procedural memory. So these subcortical structures are really, really important in kind of ingraining these, these habits and these memory pro and these, uh, these muscle processes without us really having a way of explaining it. It never really got to the cortex. And when we're talking about and this, and there's, there's a really nice slide coming up that kind of goes through the flow chart of all of this, because I'm like, well, this one's then divided into these ones, and this one's divided <coughs> into these ones. So this is looking at declarative memory. Declarative memory is something we're going to be talking about mostly, because that's, that's what we, we study mostly as researchers. Uh, you can't really do much procedural stuff in an MRI because you can't move in an MRI. And so when we're talking about declarative memory, it's split into semantic memory. And this is probably review for a lot of you guys. I'm sure you guys have seen this quite a bit. Um, but it's important in a different way for this class because it's going to show that these are tied to different brain structures and different pathways. So semantic memory is memory for just kind of things that we've learned without any contextual information, right? So we know that George Washington was the first president of the United States, but we can't necessarily bring to mind where we were when we learned this. You can't think of who was sitting next to us in class or who the teacher was or what the room smelled like or what the color of the wall was, anything like that. It's kind of devoid of this contextual information. And it's just kind of stored as these objects that we can pull up at any given time. Whereas episodic memory is more of this autobiographical type memory where there's an agent involved. And it's usually the self, right? We're describing something that we've been through. So I can tell you about when I hiked the subway in Zion, what the air felt like, how cold the water was, what, what things smelled like, how tired I was. You can add all of these things. And the really important thing to remember, and this is going to come up a lot when we start talking about the actual brain systems that are involved in this type of stuff, is that episodic memory involves context. And episodic memory is really, really tied to the, the medial temporal lobe system, which we'll talk about where the hippocampus is. And the hippocampus is really, really important for laying down context and contextual details. And so we have semantic memory. So this is kind of more recognition type stuff. And episodic memory, which is referring to contextual, kind of autobiographical type stuff. And I say recognition and context because that's going to come up later on in the lecture, in Wednesday's lecture. Uh, you need to know which brain structures are involved in kind of this recognition type memory versus ones that are involved in laying down actual events. And so when we're talking about the process of memory, and this is where it just it kind of it snowballs. There's tons of different things. Memory is this overarching umbrella term because these memory processes go through stages. 
So we have encoding, where we have all of this information that's hitting our senses at any given time. And we talked about intention, these bottlenecks, this filtering of information to so only grab on to the things that are important for our goals. That's kind of referring to this encoding process, deciding whether or not things that are coming in through our senses are actually important to what we want to accomplish. And if they are important, we want to somehow create some storage mechanism. We want to encode that pattern so that it can be brought up in the future so that we can kind of refer to it when we're in another important type event like the one that we were in. Uh, and after that thing has been stored, in order to actually use it, we need to be able to retrieve it. So all three of these processes, if you put someone in an MRI scanner, and we've talked about contracts, right? Uh, if you were to give someone a task that involved all three of these different things, you could actually compare them to one another. And you can say, what re brain regions are more active for encoding than for storage? And you're going to get certain regions that pop up that are specific for this part. You're going to get regions that pop up for storage and other ones that pop up for retrieval. So these are very differentiated between one another when we're talking about the actual cognitive mechanisms. Now, encoding itself is a process that requires first that we kind of filter out that sensory information. And this ties into our attention lecture. So we talked about bottlenecks, about the fact that we have tons and tons and tons of sen sensory information that's bombarding the brain every single moment. Yet we're only aware of a very, very small amount of it because we've decided what's important, and that's part of this acquisition portion. Heavily, heavily tied to these attention mechanisms that we talked about a couple weeks ago, or last week. And after we've decided what's important, and we've decided to keep that thing online, to hold it in short-term memory, then we're <laughs> gonna compare that thing that we have online to what our goals are and intentions are at that given moment. And if if this thing is really, really important, then it starts to go through the consolidation process. And so the consolidation process is referring to this idea that we're stabilizing that memory, that we're, we're adding strength to it so that if we try to activate it, it will pop back up online. And something that we'll look at uh, kind of in today's lecture and more on Wednesday is that people that have head trauma, usually have retrograde amnesia for the last couple of minutes, the last couple of hours from when that happened. And what they think is happening is that the reason they're losing a couple of hours before the event happened, right? So you get in a car accident and then you don't remember the whole like hour drive that you were just in the car. They think that's because those memories, that whole hour that you were in the car was still in the consolidation process. And that's why you lost all of that because it's really, really common with retrograde amnesia to just lose a couple of hours. So this slide is really, really nice for studying uh, because I think I have something highlighted for almost every single one of these terms in this flowchart. So it's when you're really thinking about this, uh, short-term memory, working memory, sensory memory is this really, really short process where things are just kind of being manipulated and kept online really temporarily. But once they make it past this step and they get into long-term memory, there's a bunch of different types of memory that are happening here. Um, and each and every one of these, the reason that they're brought up in this way is because every single one of these different types of memory relies on a different type of brain region. And usually I tell you not to memorize a bunch of brain regions. The brain regions that we're going to be going over in this lecture are ones that I do want you to remember because they're going to come up and be associated with very specific things. So we've already talked about procedural memory and the basal ganglia, really, really important. Something that's going to come up at the end of today's lecture is that classical conditioning is heavily involved with the cerebellum. Uh, Non-associative learning involves these reflex pathways that we've talked about. Uh, and then these ones over here, the de declarative memory, things that we can actually say and talk to people about and communicate, really, really heavily involved with the medial temporal lobe. And we know from lesion patients like HM, who had both of them completely removed, he was not able to form new declarative memories. And so he was still able to do all of this stuff. So all of this stuff was still making it into long-term memory, but none of this declarative memory was.
And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about in these next couple of slides. Or actually, no, failures is later on. So we're going to dive a little bit into those different regions I was just talking about here. Uh, and this is going to be very surface level for a couple of these. But there are some like main takeaway points that you guys can kind of keep in your mind that will come back up when we start diving more deeply into these on Wednesday. So the medial temporal lobe system is the most important for that declarative type memory that I was just talking about. It's a, it's a complex system. It's kind of uh, buried deep within the temporal lobe, kind of pressed up against those, those older subcortical brain structures. And so this is kind of a phylogenetically older system, and it's been kind of adapted and added onto as the mammalian brain got more complex. And it's composed of these regions, and these regions are the ones that I was saying I do want you to remember. I tell you guys a lot not to memorize a bunch of brain regions, but these ones are going to come up a lot in the next, uh, the rest of this lecture and the, the next lecture as well. So the hippocampus is one that you guys are probably really familiar with. That's kind of this seahorse looking thing right here. Uh, really heavily involved in laying down context. There are cells that we'll talk about on Monday called place cells that are actually recording where in space you are. And that con contextual information is what allows us to kind of bind these different sensory events to the context that they were experienced in. Now, the parahippocampal area back here is really heavily tied into the dorsal stream, and so it's processing information about where you are. The pararhinal cortex right here is more tied into the uh, ventral stream, which is doing our object recognition type stuff. And so this is really heavily involved in kind of semantic type stuff. Uh, and I'll go back over this in just a second. And then the interrhinal cortex, this part right here, is kind of the gatekeeper. So all information has to go through the interrhinal cortex before it gets into the hippocampus. So this whole lobe receives input from all the different cortical regions. So it receives really highly processed information. And a lot of the early evidence about what this thing did came from patients that lost it. And that's what we'll talk about after we kind of go through the anatomy. So first one is going to be the hippocampus. So hippocampus in, uh, in Greek actually means seahorse. And when they dissected it, it actually looks like a seahorse. That's why it got its name. Um, and this is really, really important in forming new memories, new episodic long-term memories, uh, new declarative memories in general. Uh, it's not necessarily heavily involved in storage of those memories because people can lose their hippocampus, as we'll look at later in this lecture, and can still have a bunch of their older memories. And so it's really involved in kind of encoding and storing that thing initially. And then once those memories are kind of stored in the cortex, it doesn't have as much of a role in uh, retrieving them. This structure is really, really complex. And we've, like, researchers have been really, really interested in its structure. So it's been mapped out really, really well. We know exactly how information is coming in, where the information is going out. Uh, all of it comes through and leaves the internal cortex. That's what EC is right here. And we'll look at kind of the, the cellular structure of this on Wednesday. But the flow of the information through it is really, really tightly controlled. So the interrhinal cortex. So this is the one that I was talking about that's kind of the, the gatekeeper to the hippocampus. So all of the information is coming into the interrhinal cortex and then passing into the, the hippocampus. And it receives really, really highly processed input. So this isn't necessarily receiving stuff from like primary visual cortex, which is just kind of lines and edges. Uh, this is receiving things after they've been turned into perception, after they've been turned into objects. Those lines were put into corners, that were put into rectangles. And eventually, we recognize that we're looking at a table. Uh, Interrhinal cortex is going to get table. It's not going to get lines and corners and edges. And it's also receiving information about kind of goals and preferences and what's going on with the body right now. So it's able to kind of tie all of these things together. Believe that there's a lot of binding going on in the interrhinal cortex before it gets into the hippocampus. So um, this will come up again uh, right here. I have highly underlined, uh, but something I want you to really take away is the fact that the interrhinal cortex is like the gateway to the, the hippocampus. That all of the information is going to come into the interrhinal cortex first and then pass it into the hippocampus. <coughs> 
And so it receives input from pararhinal and from parahippocampus. And we'll talk about the differences between those in this next couple of slides. So pararhinal cortex. So this is the one that's more towards uh, the front. It's more anterior. Uh, and this one is really heavily tied into the ventral stream. And the ventral stream was really important for object recognition. So it's receiving really high pro highly processed input about what we're looking at, what we're thinking about. And so this helps facilitate recognition so we're, we're looking at something and we're identifying that that thing is an object. It's a water bottle, right? And we're then taking that water bottle and we're saying, have we seen it before? Or we're comparing it to all the water bottles we've seen before. And we're saying, is this one that I recognize? So this is something that's really important. That uh, pararhinal cortex is heavily involved in recognition. We'll look on Wednesday at uh, MRI studies that have looked at how this will light up when we're just saying yes or no, if we've seen something before. Um, but isn't as involved in uh, memorizing entire events. And so this is doing just a quick check. Have we seen it? Yes or no? And it's doing that because of where it's at, because it's tied into that ventral stream pathway. The parahippocampal cortex, um, and I, I say tightly coupled with hippocampal function, uh, because hippocampus is really, really important for context. A lot of that context is coming from the parahippocampus. And so the parahippocampus, so I was just talking about pararhinal cortex, which is here, right? This, this anterior blue region here. And that's part of this ventral stream. So when information is being processed, visual information is being processed, it's coming this way. As it's coming this way, the perception is getting more and more complex. Corners, edges, lines, legs, all that. And then here, we now have this perception of a table. And then it's going into the parietal cortex and saying, have we seen this thing before? Do we recognize this thing? Parahippocampal cortex is getting information from the dorsal stream. And the dorsal stream is really important for where information, for locating things in space, right? And so we've talked about parahippocampus already. When we talked about object recognition, you guys remember the parahippocampal place area? This was uh, in conjunction with extrastriate body area and with the fusiform face area. This was an area that lit up when we were looking at scenes, when we were making judgments about whether something was inside or outside or whether a house was at the bottom of a mountain or not. And so this area is really heavily involved with kind of setting the scene, of laying down that contextual information. And this gives the hippocampus a lot of what it's using to work off of. And so what we see is that the pararhinal cortex is kind of on this end of the interrhinal cortex, and the parahippocampus is on this end. But I talked about how all information goes through the interrhinal cortex before it gets to the hippocampus. So what's happening is we're combining all of this contextual information, all of this information from the where pathway with all of the information from the what pathway. And so we're binding what we're seeing with where we're seeing it. That's how the flow of information is kind of converging. Now the cortex is where a lot of storage is actually happening. And so there's a lot of evidence from MRI studies that when we're experiencing something, when we're encoding something, and these sensory regions are coming online, those same sensory regions are coming back online when we're retrieving something. And so these memory systems are actually just relighting up those same things that just happened. And they're kind of recreating that experience in a way that's internal. So we talked about mirror neurons, how mirror neurons are firing when we're not actually doing something, but when we're looking at something. This is a similar concept. It's reactivating these regions that were active, but in a way that's not actually outwardly reflexive. We're not actually doing those things again. We're just kind of creating this internal perception of them. So this is something I was hinting at when, we, when, I, when I mentioned the hippocampus, is that the hippocampus is really, really heavily involved with laying down these, these memories, uh, with recording new information. But once that information is consolidated, once that information is stable, it's transferred to the cortex. And so when someone loses their hippocampus, 
uh, as we'll talk about with HM, he was still able to remember like most of his life, all these auto autobiographical memories and everything. And so hippocampus is really important for laying down those new ones, but not necessarily important in retrieving ones that have already been stabilized. So frontal and parietal lobes play a huge role. So I talked about this, this whole point up here about the same ones that are active when you're encoding or active during retrieval. That's referring to kind of these, these processing pathways, right? But frontal lobe and some areas of the parietal lobe are not necessarily sensory regions. So these ones are really active in kind of searching memory in general, and kind of helping to activate those sensory regions. And we'll see frontal lobe is really heavily involved in kind of short-term and working memory. And then parietal lobe, uh, I don't get really heavily into it. There's some stuff in your book that you can read about, but the parietal lobe is not active when we're encoding things, but is really active when we're retrieving something. And so I think the parietal lobe is really active in kind of searching your memories for the things that you want. So what I want you to take away here is that the cortex is involved, is the one that's actually storing all of this stuff. Okay, so there are different types of memory that rely on different systems than the mediotemporal lobe. So the amygdala, when we get into emotion, you'll see that like people that don't have an amygdala have a really hard time learning from mistakes, especially from like mistakes that are supposed to invoke some type of fear and make you not want to do that again. Uh, there's this girl that they talk about in the book that would like she had been held at knife point and like been through all these different crazy things and kept putting herself in the same situations over and over again. And they were linking it to the idea that she didn't have an amygdala. So this is really important for aversive type learning. Uh, basal ganglia, we've talked a lot about. Uh, this wasn't in your version, but I thought it might be something that would tie back into things for studying purposes. So basal ganglia is really important for procedural type stuff. So for muscle memory, these are the habitual type actions that you do over and over and over again. And then the cerebellum, this was something we talked about in that action lecture. It's really, really heavily involved in predictive type learning. And that's why it's been tied to conditioning. So classical conditioning, predicting that something is going to happen based on something that's happening right now. And remember, we have like 75% of our neurons are in the cerebellum. And so it's really making a lot of these predictions about what's going to happen based on what's happening right now. Cool. So we'll get into how these things fail, this idea of just trying and trying and trying, and you just can't bring to mind what you want to remember. Amnesia is kind of this broad term that kind of describes all of these different uh, memory losses, right? Uh, it can be caused by a number of things, so surgery and disease, uh, physical and psychological trauma. Uh, I actually did my master's work on how emotion modulates these memory processes and how like certain Eyewitness testimony is probably crap because uh, our hippocampus shuts down in high stress type situations. So this is affecting all of our different senses, uh, all of our different sensory type uh, learning pathways. And so these people, they, they develop different deficits based on the region that, that's affected. And this was what I was kind of hinting at of uh, a lot of the early work in memory separated these things out, that whole flow chart that I showed you. A lot of that came from these amnesia patients, where it was like they'd have one thing but not have the other. And so that's kind of this idea. So they can, they can still have short-term memory but not have long-term memory, or they can still have long-term memory and not have very good short-term memory. Declarative versus non-declarative type stuff. So. Amnesia in general, so these are the ones that I want you to remember. Uh, so retrograde amnesia is loss of events before the actual trauma happened, whether it was a lesion or surgery or whatever. Uh, it's losing memory that happened before that. And usually, like I've kind of hinted at, it's usually only a couple of minutes or hours. Uh, and you usually still have a lot of the older information. Um, 
the cases where you lose all of your past information uh, are a lot trickier and usually involve like attention mechanisms and parts of the brain that are responsible for actually searching memory. Uh, but this is something that's usually most commonly temporarily li limited. And then interrograde is losing stuff that happened after. So this is referring to the people that can't form new memories. And so I like to just kind of think of it as interrograde after, starts with an A, if that helps. And this is something that we'll, we'll look at in these next couple of slides with lesion studies, with uh, HM, not being able to form new memories. Dory from Finding Nemo, interrograde amnesia. All right, so this was something that I've, I've hinted at, is that a lot of the, the early work um, was dealing with these lesion studies where an entire part of the brain was removed and then we kind of looked at what kind of behavioral stuff that happened. My computer just beeped. Let me make sure my recording's still going. Oh, it was? Okay, never mind. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, uh, this is something I've already said a bunch of time, uh, but this is who we're going to talk about in a minute. So this is actually HM's brain. And so he was having uh, intractable seizures, seizures almost every single day. Um, and you end up at this point where your life is so affected by it that you're willing to go in and have huge portions of your brain taken out. And this was at a time where they had already done lesions of this kind. But usually they were only removing it unilaterally. They were only moving it on, removing it on one side. So this is one of the first patients that they ever went in and removed both of them. And they were like, well, we've removed one before and it didn't really do anything. So let's just remove both of them because we think that that's where this guy's seizures are coming from. And sucks to be HM because, yeah, it never formed a new declarative memory afterwards. So... He didn't show any cognitive impairments, which is really important. So this wasn't affecting his ability to attend to things. Uh, his personality was still, still the same. He was still the same guy. He just couldn't form any new memories. He still remembered everything up to the last two years before the surgery. So this is a bit longer than we usually see for retrograde amnesia. But like I hinted at earlier, retrograde amnesia is usually limited. It usually doesn't get rid of all of your memory. So he had normal short-term memory, and he had procedural memory. So he could keep things online for a certain amount of time, uh, but after a certain amount of time passed, none of that none of that stuff that was in short-term memory ever made it to the long-term memory. There was no consolidation happening. Uh, he was able to they sit him down at a piano and teach him a song on the piano, and the next day they'd have him play the same song. He had no memory of ever playing it before, but he could play it better than he did the day before. So there's something going on with muscle memory still. He's able to still learn new skills. His body's able to still learn new things. It's just things that he verbalizes. Uh, someone would go and, and talk to him every day and introduce themselves, even though they've been working with him for three years. Hey, my name's Harry. So the idea here is that the medial temporal lobe, which he had removed, really, really important with transferring things from short-term memory into long-term memory. So another form of memory loss comes from dementia. And I had a, a professor in undergrad that uh, said something that really kind of stuck with me that was really interesting about dementia. And it's the fact that at age 70, the prevalence is about 14%. But by age 90, it's all the way up to 40. And as you get even older than 90, that prevalence rate goes up. And what my professor was talking about was that it's not necessarily a disease because diseases usually have low prevalence rates, right? Uh, usually even less than 14%. And so what this probably is, is probably an aging mechanism. This is probably just something that's happening. Uh, these cells, because what's happening is that these cells are dying. They're getting worn out. And you see here that like the whole part of the brain is just shrinking. Um, I can actually, when I'm doing brain studies, if I have a... Uh, a collection of subjects that are like in their 20s, that are healthy, 
And then I have a, another group that's in their 50s or 60s or even in their 70s. I can just by looking at their brain activity tell which ones are the older ones and which ones aren't. Based on how big these ventricles are, these things will just get huge compared to normal subjects. Uh, and so we have this dying off of all of these cells and it's kind of, it's diffuse. It, I changed this on your slide. Um, I didn't find good evidence for what I had listed on your slide. Uh, so I just kind of added some other tidbits. So it starts with this mild cognitive impairment. So you're starting to see some of these cells die off and it's kind of this diffuse process. It's not necessarily targeted in any region of the brain. These cells are just getting worn out and dying. And so you may start to notice some attention effects or you may not be able to kind of think of a word. And a lot of this, this mild cognitive impairment is something that just that person recognizes. He's starting to notice that he's not really with it anymore. He doesn't really have that same snap that he used to. Um, and then once you progress into these early stages, these deficits start to be noticeable to other people. Uh, you're really, really obviously kind of behind the curve on a lot of stuff, not able to pay attention, not able to remember things. Um, and then by late stage, these patients are unable to care for themselves. And so Alzheimer's disease, counts for about 60 to 70 percent of these dementia cases cases um, and it's characterized by this extracellular deposition of these plaques these uh, beta amyloid plaques there's a lot of research that's going into why this is the case a lot of people are looking at uh, kind of immune responses and inflammation responses that may be contributing to this um, really tough to pick up with uh, modern imaging techniques so a lot of this stuff is kind of found post-mortem um, and the other uh, kind of additional factor is these uh, neurofibular tangles that are happening in the cell. So the plaques are accumulating outside of the cell. You have these beta amyloid uh, type structures that are kind of just accumulating and forming these big blobs between the cells and it starts to break down the ability for these cells to synapse on one another. And that's kind of what I was hinting at, like the actual wiring is getting blocked. And so they're not able to talk to each other as efficiently. And then inside the cell, these tangles are actually unwrapping the microtubules in the cell. And the microtubules are like the skeletal structure of these cells. And so the integrity inside the cell and the ability outside of the cell uh, are both kind of diminished at the same time. And it really shuts down a lot of these network properties. And when we get into consciousness, I mean, that is a big part of consciousness is they think that like consciousness itself kind of emerges from this network property. And if those networks aren't tied together, then it, you end up with a very different <coughs> conclusion. So just something I want you to remember, uh, this is probably a review, I'm sure you guys have seen this a lot. So plaques and tangles associated with Alzheimer's disease. And something that usually goes along with Alzheimer's disease Oh, this is a, an extra point down there at the bottom. So medial temporal lobes are the ones that start to get hit the hardest. And that's why that's one of the most noticeable attributes of Alzheimer's disease is memory loss that's coming from the medial temporal lobes. Uh, but keep in mind that this is not necessarily a memory type condition. This is just something that hits the, the memory systems first. But this is a diffuse process. This is happening all over the brain and it's breaking down all kinds of different cognitive processes. And this one kind of goes along with Alzheimer's, so this vascular dementia. So those same kinds of plaques um, and other types of plaques are building up inside the actual vessels within the brain. And it causes some of these vessels to weaken and to actually break. So an infarct is actually some blood is escaping that vein and kind of diffusing out into the, into the brain. And because of that, we're losing oxygenation. And so these cells aren't getting the fuel that they need to survive. So this is a smaller percentage of the dementia cases, uh, but this usually occurs at the same time as Alzheimer's disease because it's really heavily tied to the accumulation of these plaques. So most of what we know about memory, so I brought up dementia to kind of show that there is this aging process that starts to break down these, these different systems naturally. But a lot of what we know actually comes from the lesion studies because dementia, is really hard to make conclusions about because of how diffuse it is. Because it's affecting all of these different things, it's hard to say that, that what they're experiencing and what they're kind of doing behaviorally is linked to one specific thing. So 
we'll go in now into kind of, uh, like I mentioned earlier, kind of a surface level uh, look at some of these different memory systems. And then on Wednesday, we'll take uh, a deeper dive into these and kind of look at the, the cellular stuff that's happening. Uh, so sensory memory, you guys are probably pretty familiar with sensory memory. Uh, so if you've ever been watching a football game or like playing a video game or something, and your wife or significant other or mom or someone comes in and says something to you, and you're not paying attention to them at all, and they think you are, but then they give you crap, and they're like, why aren't you paying attention to me? And you're able to repeat back to them what they said. Even, even though you didn't really process it or pay attention to it or anything, you can still echo it. And it's this idea that we're keeping these sensory modalities online really temporarily in case we need to draw on them. And so it can be accessed really quickly, but if you wait 30 seconds after someone said something, it's a lot harder to kind of draw back on that. It needs to be something that happens really, really quickly. So it's called echoic, echoic memory in the auditory domain. Um, iconic memory in the visual domain, that's not something you need to memorize. Uh, just different ways that researchers that study different things could put their names on stuff. So this is some evidence from EEG uh, that, was, that was pretty cool. So they were playing a stimulus over and over and over again that was the same. So a beep over and over again, the same beep over and over. And then all of a sudden they would hear a different sound, like a click. And that would be the oddball event. And what they noticed is that in the EEG signal, so you had this dotted line was representing all of the times that they heard the beep. And all of a sudden they heard something that might be important and you see that the brain is actually keeping that sensory information online. So really kind of interesting. And once you know about this, you start to become like more aware that it's there. You start to pay attention to the fact that you have these stores of sensory information. And so this has been called a mismatch negativity or mismatch field. Uh, that's not something I necessarily want you to remember. I just want you to remember that sensory uh, information is kept online temporarily and that these auditory signals can persist a lot longer than visual signals can. And I think that this is something that kind of ties into what you're saying about echoic and iconic memory is that I think a lot of people are a lot better at echoic memory than iconic memory. And that's something that pops up here. It'd be interesting to look at people that have kind of a, a really good uh, picture type memory and see if this is longer for those types of people. Or do a longitudinal study and see if these can get longer. Short term memory. So a longer time course than what we see with sensory memory. So this is stuff that once we've decided that sensory memory is important, we move it into short term. And there were original, so Miller's law was this idea that we can hold about seven things plus or minus two in short term memory. A lot of the follow-up work says that that's actually too much, and that it's usually about four plus or minus one. And this is something that's actually common across other species as well. There was this really cool study I saw one time, uh, or not necessarily a study, I think it was more of an anecdote, but um, crows are really good at counting. And there was this farmer, and there was a crow that kept going into his barn, and so what he did is every time he'd walk into the barn, the crow would leave and it would go wait in a tree and wait for him to leave. And as soon as he left, the crow would come back into the barn. And so he's like, all right, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go in there with a friend and I'm gonna have my friend leave and then the crow is gonna see someone leave and it's gonna come back in. And the crow saw two people walk in, saw one person walk out and didn't come back in. So he's like, all right, well, I'm gonna do three people. I'm gonna have three people go in, two people come out. Same thing, crow didn't come back. It wasn't until he got to five that the crow wasn't able to keep count and the crow came back. So kind of interesting that this is something that's similar across species. Frontal lobe, this is something I want you guys to remember, really, really heavily involved in this short-term memory process. Uh, something interesting, the reason I have Dory up here is because I don't really like the term short-term memory loss because she doesn't have short-term memory loss. Her short-term memory is fine. She can hold a conversation, right? It's her long-term memory that's affected. She's not able to lay down new memories. <coughs> Enterograde amnesia 
And so I just thought that was, it was interesting that she always talks about having short-term memory loss, but her short-term memory is fine. P. Sherman, 42 Wallaby Way, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something uh, early on, this was the idea of how these mechanisms were working. Uh, this was before we started to really understand parallel processing and all of these things. So originally there was this idea that sensory information comes in and we kind of have this portion where the sensory information is kept online. It's kind of what I've described so far. Uh, and then there's attention processes that move it from sensory memory down into short-term memory. And so it's kind of kept online. And if it's rehearsed, if it's gone through over and over and over again, then that's when we can consolidate it into long-term memory. Um, and they kind of had this idea that each stage of this process, there was like, uh, abilities for that information to be lost. So either something uh, happened that caused it to not be as good anymore, or there were other things that were being attended to at the same time that kind of interfered with it. Uh, the problem with this is that it assumed a very serial type structure. And so it assumed that like everything had to go through this whole process in order to get here. Uh, but we see a lot of amnesic patients that actually have long-term memory abilities without really good short-term memory. So I kind of brought some of this uh, into question. And this was when working memory was really kind of taking a hold. And so up until now, we just kind of thought of short-term memory as this, this place where things were just kind of kept online. Uh, but then we started to see that information could actually be manipulated while you were holding things online. And so we started to look, instead of this kind of serial structure, we kind of looked at this kind of distributed uh, network structure. We had all of these different regions that were kind of interacting and uh, behaving with one another. And so they talked about this three-part system that had a central executive. So that's where frontal lobe comes in. Frontal lobe knows what our goals and our intentions are, knows what information is important and what information we should be attending to. And the central executive system is working in conjunction with this phonological loop and the visuospatial sketch pad. So this ties into what we were just talking about with echoic and iconic memory. Um, so phonological loop is this idea that we're, we're storing things in kind of an auditory type way. Um, I kind of refer to this as the voice in our head, our ability to say words and to think words. Uh, when we look at people in an MRI, that's what's popping up is this, this area over here when we're rehearsing these things. Uh, Visuospatial sketch pad, on the other hand, is actually trying to bring entire visual scenes back online. Like we were just talking about, trying to count the stripes on the cat's tail and things like that. And they think that these things are kind of working in conjunction with this central executive and we're like, we're keeping things online visually, we're keeping things online auditorially. Uh, and then we're kind of interacting with those and figuring out what's important for our goals and intentions at any given moment. And if it is important, then it gets sent to medial temporal lobe and gets put into long-term memory. So the phonological loop is really heavily involved with this uh, super marginal gyrus right here, kind of the edge of the, the temporal lobe. Uh, and this pops up a lot when we're encoding information acoustically. And so they've seen the first idea about this, this encoding process came from the fact that when we were showing subjects letters, when they forgot the letters, they were actually picking letters that, were, that sounded the same in replacement form. And so it was this idea that even though they're looking at letters, they're actually saving those letters acoustically. They're rehearsing those things in kind of a, a sound type way inside of their brain. And so when we have a lesion here in the super marginal gyrus, uh, we can't hold strings of words. And so we can't rehearse those words. Um, I don't know, I need to look into whether or not people actually report having like thought problems if they have a lesion here, if they're able to actually like think the way that they used to. I don't know. Um, but they, they show that the rehearsal process, so going over those words over and over and over again, is tying into the frontal lobe. So this is kind of the, this BA44, this is one of the Broadman areas, it's part of the frontal lobe, so that would be part of that central executive type uh, system that we were thinking about. 
And so as we're rehearsing these words, we're deciding whether or not they're important enough to save the memory. And that's the role that the frontal lobe is playing. It's kind of comparing that to goals and intentions. Now, this is kind of the opposite idea that we're storing things visually. Uh, and when we have the damage to that area I showed you kind of near the back of the brain, this, uh, this edge between the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe, uh, they have a really hard time uh, retaining sequences of location information. So if you've ever played the game Simon, where you have to remember the sequence, there's, there's no words there. You can't attach any kind of semantic meaning. I mean, you could, like blue, red, whatever, but uh, usually you're remembering kind of the visual properties of it. And so people that have uh, lesions to that spot near the back of the brain are unable to, to really play this game really well. And so what they did is they, they had this task, so they were trying to, to actually show that these were two different mechanisms. And so they presented them, um, I wish I had a picture of the actual uh, task, but um, they were either using a location marker, which was just kind of a shape in a certain spot on the screen, uh, or they were using a letter in a certain spot. Um, and they asked the participants to remember where those letters or those markers were uh, during this delay period. And then something would come on, and then they were told to, sh to say where the thing had been once they get the prompt. Um, and the idea was if they were remembering a letter, they were rehearsing that letter acoustically in their head. Um, and if they were remembering just kind of an object that didn't have any kind of semantic meaning to it, then they were just thinking about where that thing had been. They were thinking about the location. Um, and what they found was that exactly, you had uh, verbal memory up here is kind of lighting up that same region that we were just talking about. That's kind of that Broadman area 44 right here. Um, it's harder to see kind of the super old, uh, I think this is kind of it. Uh, it's hard to say with MRI whether you're getting at what you want to. Uh, but this is some really robust activity. So they're actually rehearsing this thing. So this is that Broadman Area 44 that we just talked about. Um, and then here in the visual spatial task, we have this is that region back of the brain, the occipital parietal kind of region right there. Um, and then that's talking with the frontal lobe still. So that's where you're still getting this activity up here. It's still being rehearsed in a way. Uh, but this idea, comparing these two, so this is a contrast, like we talked about with MRI, saying show me where there's greater activity for this task than there is for this task. And it's showing that these are dissociable, that there are different processes involved in this. And that it's not just kind of a theory that these researchers have worked up. So something I've kind of hinted at is that the cortex is really heavily involved in long-term memory. And long-term memory itself is kind of the result of all of the acquisition and consolidation processes kind of getting to completion. And so it relies on hippocampus for creation, uh, but doesn't rely on the hippocampus for long-term storage. So once something has been consolidated, it's stored in the cortex and we can still activate it. And the storage is happening in these sensory cortical regions. So we're reactivating the things that were online when we actually experience the event. And this was that idea, just that I keep coming back to, the reason that we're defining all of these different things is because we can see dissociations between the two types of memory in certain amnesiac or lesion patients. So something I really want you to take away is kind of this point right here. This is uh, really important to know that the hippocampus is involved at the beginning, but isn't involved after things have been consolidated. So this is another study that's looking at the difference between these. Um, so this is all kind of a repeat of what we just went over. Um, and so showing that these MRI studies are basically just showing that declarative and non-declarative memory are separable. Um, these are different types of declarative memory that are popping up. They're both activating. So you have hippocampus here and hippocampus here. So both for words and for objects, we're seeing medial temporal lobe activation. So it's involved in recording things that we can then talk about. And then episodic uh, includes context. So a lot of this is kind of repeat 
but remember that episodic is a lot different than just knowledge that we have about ourselves, right? We don't necessarily remember how bright the room was when we came out of the, out of the womb, right? We have stories that we heard about when we were born and what happened, but we don't actually have the context. We just remember some type of information about it. Um, it usually includes the self as an agent, or you have some type of other agent that you're describing that went through something. And the hippocampus is really, really important for laying down these contextual details. And so that's the kind of idea that I want you to, to differentiate between episodic and semantic is the idea that episodic contains context. And because it contains context, it's really heavily involved with the hippocampus. And so this would be kind of the opposite of that. So this is factual knowledge that's not necessarily Included with context and something that we talked a lot about was uh, the kind of uh, pararhinal cortex is doing a lot of this. So you have all of this information, all of these different regions around the brain are, are processing these different objects. And then all of that's kind of coming down here and then coming in through the pararhinal and the hippocampus area here. And so these show kind of these differentiations between these two networks, between semantic type information and just remembering rote facts versus actually remembering entire events. Um, and then these are the regions where there's a lot of overlap. And it's interesting that the regions that there is overlap is the frontal lobe, because the frontal lobe is really heavily involved in all of these processes. So that's where all of this information is being integrated, it's where our goals and our intentions are. And so whether it's a rote fact or an event, we're comparing that with what's important right now. Um, and this was kind of an interesting idea that uh, it's not until children are about three or four that they actually start to include themselves as the agents in their stories. And so a lot, they think that these systems that actually uh, work for episodic type information are coming online a lot later. And so we're learning how to lay down a bunch of facts and knowledge and things like that, um, but then we're not actually putting them into stories until we get a little bit older. Yeah, that's what I was talking about just a minute ago. So, main takeaway point, semantic does not include context. I want you to really separate those two away from each other. Because when we talk about recognition versus episodic recall, um, recognition does not require that you remember where you learned it. Um, so this is getting back to this idea that we have a bunch of memory that's not really something that we can describe or verbalize or anything, it's just something that we acquire. And that's kind of this whole purple portion of the pie chart right here. And we'll go into just a couple of those right now. We've already talked about quite a few of them in the action lecture with basal ganglia, uh, cerebellum, we'll tie cerebellum to classical conditioning here. But remember that the medial temporal lobe is not involved in this process. It doesn't need to be involved in this process. So we have procedural memory, which is these cortical basal ganglia loops. So this is this is muscle memory. So muscle memory. I know that I had uh, basal ganglia highlighted on that last lecture. So just remember that basal ganglia is really tied to procedural memory. And I feel like we've hit on this a lot so far. Um, and it also ties into things like reading too. So it's not it's not just motor skills, but it's something that we can do really quickly without having to give a lot of cognitive type attention or resources to. Because once we know how to read, it's really easy to do that without thinking about what it is we're actually doing. And then we have classical conditioning. Uh, not really going to go over what classical conditioning is, because I'm sure that you guys have heard that like a thousand times how many psych classes you guys have been through. What I want you to, to know though is that cerebellum is really highly involved in this process. And so when we were talking about action, when we were getting into, uh, when we talked about the, the glasses that people put on, right? So you throw something at a target, you put these prism glasses on that throw things off, um, and then your brain is making a prediction about where the ball is gonna hit and that prediction isn't coming to fruition. And so the cerebellum is really highly involved in kind of correcting those actions. Um, and that's why it's involved in classical conditioning. Because in classical conditioning, 
we're making predictions about what a certain stimulus is going to cause, and we're forming our behaviors based on that. So cerebellum really heavily involved in this predictive type nature. So I would kind of tie cerebellum and prediction together on a note card if I were you. Um, and I think this is our last, or no, I think we have a couple more. Um, so non-associative learning is uh, really heavily tied into our reflex pathways. Uh, they think that this is a warning system. And so uh, if you like touch a hot object, your hand's gonna automatically come off and you're gonna learn not to touch hot objects anymore. It's not necessarily that you had to verbalize that or you had to learn that in any way. Your body has this kind of aversive reaction where it just kind of is really hesitant to touch things like that in the future without you having to have any kind of cognitive explanation for it. Um, and it's really also, it's also involved in these kind of simple learning things like habituation, where we get used to a stimulus and we kind of forget about it. Um, it's really interesting, people with uh, cochlear implants uh, that get them later in life complain a lot about certain sounds that they didn't know existed, like the air conditioning running or the sound of the, the refrigerator in the kitchen. And they actually get really annoyed with it and they turn it off. And this is kind of what this is getting at, is that we've learned to just tune those things out because they're so present all the time that it's not worth our cognitive capacity to really pay attention to them. So that's kind of what I'm getting at with this kind of habituation and sensitization here. And then this last one is gonna be priming. So uh, it's this change in our response to something based on kind of prior information that we already have. So if I saw uh, the word rabbit, or if I heard the word rabbit, uh, I'm gonna have this contextual idea of a rabbit. Um, and then if I was asked to spell the word hair, I would spell it H-A-R-E instead of H-A-I-R. This is this idea that our, our brain is being primed already. We're keeping things online to make decisions about things that are coming next. Uh, it's usually modality specific, and so if I'm priming in the auditory domain, uh, then it's probably only going to be like uh, speaking stuff that is affected. Um, and perceptual priming, so perceptual is referring to the fact like uh, showing the word rabbit or something like that. Um, you can also do priming that's conceptual or semantic. So if you show the word dog or the word wag or a bunch of words that are associated with dog, it's going to prime them to be more prone to um, fill in the blank bone if they're prompted with it. Uh, this type of priming lasts uh, a much shorter period of time. It's really brief. And this kind of led to this uh, researcher proposing this perceptual representation stream that when we see things, when we're told to remember things, they're kept online in a way that we're not necessarily consciously aware of. So they did this study where they showed uh, the subjects a list of words and told them to remember all of these words. And then they brought them back in for another session that uh, in some cases was even like two weeks later. And they gave them a bunch of words that had missing portions here. And the people were more likely to fill in the letters based on words that were in that original list than words that would also fit the same thing. So you could put stress here instead of street, but if street had been on that original list of words, they're a lot more likely to fill this one in. So it's this idea that we have kind of this, this stream of re representations that's kind of online all the time, even if we're not aware of it. So I know this wasn't the most exciting lecture, lots of definitions and things like that. Uh, we'll dive more into some of the biology and stuff on Wednesday.